maybe we should go ahead and start. Um, can I, so you guys, um, I, was, I have to admit it's been, I think I, I was asked to give this talk like many months ago, so I've forgotten the context a little bit. You guys are res a residents in ophthalmology and we'll do a research rotation as part of the residency, is that the, the idea? Yeah, okay, so, um, so that's probably why I'm here, to talk to you about doing statistical analyses as part of your uh, research rotation and then later, you know, later in your career. Um, the, um, I should mention that I'm the um, director of the Study Design and Biostatistics Center um, and the Population Health uh, Research Foundation, which are basically research infrastructures to support uh, research here at the Health Science Center. Um, and you guys have access to, to, to our center uh, for various kinds of research support. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to talk about some topics in um, study design, basically, the, um, and just the whole process of doing research where statistics comes in. Um, the, um, so I mentioned the Study Design and Biostatistics Center. It's in the Population Health Research Foundation. This is a part of the University Center for Clinical and Translational Science. Um, and we started in 2008, this was a small little group of four statisticians. Um, there's a lot of research needs here at the institution, so this has now grown up to a big a multidisciplinary group that provides research support. Um, and it actually includes not just statisticians, but also psych, um, epidemiologists, psychometricians, qualitative researchers, health economists. So basically, it's the whole group of people who are, who are expert in research methodologies related to statistics, but other quantitative health science type disciplines. Um, we kind of work together uh, to provide an you know, overall uh, uh, I'd say quantitative health science research support. Um, and we, the, the center is largely funded by having, separate, having arrangements with different departments and divisions, but this includes the Department of Ophthalmology. Um, so you guys actually have access to a certain amount of free support from the center. Um, and I should mention, stop me anytime if you have any questions. It's not the kind of thing you have to wait to the end. Um, so this, this Population Health Research uh, Foundation, um, it, just to give you an idea, it's structured with these five cores, which includes the Study Design and Biostatistics Center that I just mentioned, Cancer Biostatistics, Health Measurement Survey Methods, Health Economics, and Systematic Review. Um, the Systematic Review has to do with uh, working with the library to do systematic literature searches that might support meta-analyses, for example. Um, but we provide support in all these areas. Um, and it's a pretty broad-based sort of thing. Um, this includes clarification of research hypotheses. This is actually something that is very important in, for, in research, um, just clarifying the question. Um, and, and in fact, that in many ways is the, really the most important step. Um, and we can work with you in a way, I mean, we can make sure that the questions being asked are the kinds of questions you can address statistically um, and the questions that can be, um, you can actually have uh, addressed feasibly within your resource constraints. Um, but I'll talk, come back to this a little bit more. This is actually a, a, a key step. Um, and then this leads to developing study designs. Key element of the study design is how many patients, what sample size, or if it's an basic science, how many animals. Um, this then evolves into a statistical analysis plan. Um, it's always important and a key step whenever you would work with us is before you actually do analyses, it's writing a protocol for those analyses. It's very much like the idea of doing a research protocol before doing a study. Before doing data analyses, it's important to actually write out what those analyses are going to do and write out a plan for that, and we'll come back to why that's important in a little bit. Um, in, in the group, we have people who can help you with data collection, survey design. If you're developing instruments for measurement, which is often, I know in a lot of our work with ophthalmology in the past, this has been a key step, um, actually developing questionnaires or appropriate methods for measuring your outcome variables. And we can help with this. As I mentioned, we have a, a group that does systematic reviews. Um, this is actually often a good step before embarking on research. 
make it, it's pretty obvious, but making sure you do a, a good literature review always. Um, and sometimes that should be elevated to the status of a true systematic review, um, which is just basically a protocolized literature review that assures that your literature review is unbiased, that it's not cherry picked, that you really are getting a comprehensive review of the literature, um, um, not missing uh, you know, certain perspectives. Um, our group can actually carry out that analysis um, if you don't want to do those, but if you prefer, um, we also have people in the group who specialize in supervising pe uh, people who are clinicians who want to do their own analyses, so we can work either way. Um, the, um, and I mentioned the economic analyses with our economic core, which is getting more popular these days. Um, I've, I've been focusing on quantitative methods, which is really what the, most of the group specializes in, but there actually is a subdiscipline within this that's called qualitative research, which is usually the idea of doing focus groups, qualitative sorts of review uh, um, in situations where you may not have quantitative outcomes specified. Um, and then, of course, we can help you with writing the papers and so forth. Um, the areas of expertise are listed there. I won't go through these in great detail. Um, but I guess my the point of all this is just that uh, we do have this resource available. Um, and I would just encourage you guys uh, to, to work with us if, if you have statistical needs or needs in some of the other areas that I've just mentioned. Um, uh, I'd say a key. A key thing is to come soon enough. Um, I know if you're going on a research rotation, that's a challenge because that's a very limited time to do research. Uh, I've never really quite understood that, that particular paradigm. <laughs> um, but you need to come to us very early on uh, so we can get engaged with you at the beginning stages of the research um, so we actually have time to go back and forth. It's a very iterative process, um, and it's not a process where you come at like the last stage and just ask somebody to do analyses. Our, our work needs to be integra integrated in with the research from the very beginning. Okay, any questions about this part of this sort of thing? Okay, so next I'm just going to go through um, a, what could be a typical uh, collaboration process uh, where you would, you know, how, how would we work together if we, if we are doing uh, work to get, you know, uh, helping you with a particular study. Um, and, and as I mentioned, this will start with the actual planning the study, developing the research questions, conducting the literature review, uh, and starting to think about the study design and potential outcome variables, uh, basically thinking through the framework of the study. Um, and this is the stage where we would like the collaboration to begin, is working through this. Um, then the next step for you um, is, um, well, actually these could go hand in hand, but at some point you need to fill out a request, a, a, a collaboration request form, um, and you can just go to this website and you'll be a little form to fill out, to spell out what your needs are. Um, and I guess actually I probably should have put this before this. <laughs> uh, at this stage we'd like this to come first. Uh, it's not, if you can do a little bit of literature review first, go, that's, we like that, so those first meetings are, are more productive. Um, but if, um, if, well, even this stage will be an interactive process going back and forth. Um, then we'll have meetings, we'll work together to refine study design, data collection, and analysis uh, variables. And then this will eventually lead to the development of a statistical analysis plan, which is an actual written document that will lay out um, the, the analyses that we'll be doing. Um, we then ask you as the principal investigator to approve the analysis plan by email. Um, and this is basically means that you've agreed and committed to a particular analysis plan. Um, and then finally, we would be carrying out analyses, implementing the statistical analysis plan, finalizing results, and then that goes and leads into the final manuscript. Um, the um, starting your study, um, some of the key elements of that are, he are listed here. Um, I don't want to over, I can't overemphasize the importance of the thorough literature review to begin with. Um, I know when we've worked with uh, junior investigators before, this step sometimes isn't done complete fully and then that really just leads to a lot of, it can lead to wasted time. 
uh, and in particular use a, a design that wouldn't, development of a research design that might not be optimal for your situation or doing work that really doesn't need to be done with some, some variation is really what should be done. Um, um, at this stage, you may be considering alternative designs. Some of the issues are listed there. Um, and um, it'll be important as you go through this to start thinking of outcome variables, predictor variables. Um, for example, a key outcome variable may be mortality. Um, I guess in ophthalmology, usually not mortality, but there'll be other outcomes related to um, the visual function that will be, that should be be focusing on and those that will need to be clarified. Um, you may need to be thinking through predictor variables or grouping variables. If it's observational research, um, that means without randomized, you know, not a randomized study. Um, with observational research, it's a key step is thinking through factors that may act as confounders. Um, these are variables that are associated with both the predictor or exposure variable and the outcome you're studying. You need to think these things through and then to work out strategies for controlling for these variables. Um, and then if the relationships you're studying may vary in differing groups of patients, uh, those are called effect modifiers, uh, we would need to think, identify those ahead, ahead of time as well. Um, the request form is here, and I, I mentioned the website before. Um, it's actually a pretty short form, um, and it just pr you provide background on your project, um, what your basic objectives are. Um, if you work with a statistician already or have somebody you would like to work with, you can suggest the statistician on this form, and if they're available, we'll go ahead and assign that person. Um, filling out the form gets you into our tracking system which assures that uh, we don't lose track of the projects. The absolute worst way of contacting our center is to email me. <laughs> um, I, not that I do this intentionally, but I get so much contact that I, it can, sometimes we lose track of it. Um, important, very, 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 very important are the timelines and making sure we initiate the collaboration process early enough in, in the game to actually get the work done. Um, okay. Um, so in meeting with, um, as we meet with a statistician or a, a other member of the Population Health Research Foundation, um, we'll be refining, as we mentioned, the research questions and the hypotheses, refining and developing the study design. Um, that includes things like working out the inclusion and exclusion criteria, the analysis variables, confounders. Um, clarifying what the limitations are, which is important to acknowledge up front, um, and then working through how data will be collected. Uh, and I'll mention in this step, in data collection, it's often underemphasized, um, the institution and our center are strongly recommending not using Excel, which is the, has been a favored method in the past for collection of data. Excel is a spreadsheet that doesn't provide a basis for tracking data changes um, and it has just a whole variety of features that lead that kind of promote errors being made um, um, the, and um, instead it's much we prefer that data be collected using a, a true database um, and the database which is being used for research now and supported throughout the institution is REDCap um, and um, so I would recommend you use that um, the bioinformatics core in the Center for Clinical Translational uh, Research supports the use of REDCap and provides training and can help you get set up using it. It's actually very, very easy. Um, and it basically is structured in a way as to uh, promote uh, research and, and, and promote uh, research quality data. Um, now, um, when we're meeting and developing the analysis plan, um, the best mode we've discovered for communicating analyses is really going right and visualizing what the tables and figures are going to look like in the eventual manuscript. And so if it's possible, whenever, whenever possible, um, it's, we find it preferable to actually 
develop mock-up tables that would at least summarize the structure of the tables and figures that you're envisioning in your paper. Um, this really speeds things up when we can develop this. Okay, any questions about any of this? Okay. Um, now, I just want to mention why we're emphasizing the importance of this collaboration going from the beginning. Um, we've, there's been a lot of, uh, in the last decade or so, attention paid to um, a concern that much research that's published in the medical literature is, is actually non-reproducible um, and, or, or, and that the findings that are reported may actually be false. Um, and um, this is one paper which has been uh, kind of dramatizing this, this, this concern. Um, but the, the concerns relate back to issues of inadequate sample sizes um, where the study was done but the power calculation really wasn't done right and the study was too small to answer the research question that was being addressed. Um, another very common issue is not really understanding the size of an effect that would be expected or plausible or that the power should be, or, or that the study should be powered on. Um, and a miss, this is really getting back to sample size again, but very often there's a kind of mismatch or, you know, um, between the effect size and the sample size or the effect size that are targeted are just unrealistic. Uh, so we will do a lot of work there. Um, major issues have to do with absence of these pre-specified pre hypotheses or absence of pre-specified analyses. So the challenge here is, is that when analyses are just done post hoc, uh, and I do know a lot of groups work this way, we've seen it a lot, you could be like the abstract deadline day comes along and you just start pouring through data looking for a significant p-value to put in an abstract. That kind of work is just horribly non-reproducible. Um, you, it's a kind of post hoc data dredging that um, really is not research. Um, and um, um, and I'll show you in a minute some examples of why, the, if you come up with a significant result in that way, you really can't expect that if you were to do a new study later, you would get that that result would reproduce. Um, um, and so this is a, um, why it's so important to, before you collect your data, before you do your analyses, to spell out what your analysis plan is. Um, the, um, and this is related to the issue of the, the, really the more relationships that are evaluated, the more you test, the greater the possibility is that you're going to find some false positive results in all these relationships. Um, and then another key thing is being precise about the research you're going to do as opposed to kind of leaving things vague to be worked out during the analysis step. Um, and so what our Population Health Research Foundation tries to do is we try to help you through all these steps to avoid these errors. Okay. Um, the statistical analysis plan, which is really key, and this is, again, why the collaborations need to start early versus late so we have time to develop these and think them through carefully, um, have been more and more recognized as absolutely fundamental. Um, it's really for maybe decades, it's been clear um, that analysis plans are required for randomized studies and in fact without analysis plans many journals will not publish uh, research from a randomized study. Um, they often ask you, ask to see the analysis plan just as proof. Um, but in the last decade or so there's been more and more attention to developing an anal analysis plans not just for randomized studies but also for observational research. Okay, um, so I mentioned there's a stage where we ask, we try, we get approval of our statistical analysis plan via email. Um, and this, you know, this approval process, there's a couple reasons for it. I mean, one is just logistics. Uh, this will help assure that we don't waste time on analyses that are not what you intend to as, as, the, as the principal investigator. So we, it's making sure we've closed that loop. But it also represents a, a commitment to a particular um, analytic approach um, that's being spelled out before doing the analyses. Um, 
Now, we do, it, sometimes it, you do discover, um, you come up with findings during the analyses that suggest additional analyses. This does happen, and it's not, we're not saying we won't do these additional analyses, we will, uh, but we will keep note of what analyses were post hoc and were done and basically because some other result in the data suggested that they should be done as opposed to analyses that were pre-specified. And so that process will get documented and we'll, we'll be able to know what was pre-specified and what was post hoc. Um, and that distinction is important and actually needs to be um, expressed in the publication of the, of the uh, research. Um, then finally, all this, once analyses are done, um, then our attention will come to the actual publication process itself. And as I mentioned, we can work with you on this. Okay, so that, I'm just wanted to go through there basically what the, proce the research process is of working with our center, how to contact us, timeline issues. Uh, any questions about any of that? Yes. Yeah. It's free, and it is. Um, I don't think you're you're actually working on it's web based. Yeah. So you're, it's not necessarily that you're downloading it to your own machine, but you're reworking on the web. Any other questions? And it's very easy. I mean, I think that just about, it's always a, a one hour little training session is always su is sufficient for a typical study coordinator to learn it and actually then set it, they can, and you can then set up your data set and enter data in it. So it's, 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 a, it's a very easy system to learn. Okay. So now we're gonna talk with just about a couple of other maybe more scientific focused uh, issues. The first is I'm going to talk a more about the importance of doing studies that have adequate statistical power. Um, st as I go into this, uh, what is statistical power and why should we care about it? Most basically, when we talk about power in statistics, we mean the probability of detecting a difference which is considered to be of clinical interest or of clinical importance. Okay, so another way of saying this a little more formally, it's the probability of being able to um, detect a true positive result, where by true positive result, we mean a, a, a relationship that um, is hypothesized um, under the research hypothesis as being a clinically important relationship. So if there is this true relationship out there, what's the probability that we'll actually have enough of a sample size to detect that relationship? That's what power is. Um, if power is high and you get a non-significant result where you don't get statistical significance, um, th that means you still have an informative study, right? If the power is high, and you get a null result, a non-significant result, that means you can rule out there being a, a, an important relationship. You can say there was not a, an important relationship between these variables, and your findings should still be publishable. Negative findings are just as important as positive findings. Um, so this means that negative, non-significant studies will be informative when power is high. Um, Studies with high power give researchers greater confidence that a significant result reflects the truth. I'm gonna come back to this in a second. It turns out that if you get a positive result having done a low power, inadequately powered study, there's a very good chance that that's a false positive result. And thus a very good chance that if you publish it in the literature that you've actually published something that's not true. Um, now, if you have low power, and, and do a, uh, and, and get a negative result, which is actually a very common situation, then you really don't have anything to say, right? You just simply say, you did not achieve statistical significance, uh, but power was low, so there, that just, you, in that situation, there might have been an important effect, but you just couldn't detect it, you didn't have enough power to find it. Or there may have been no effect, and, and, and then in consequence, you got a negative result and you won't know which is which. So basically, in the setting of low power, 
a non-significant result is just completely not informative. It just doesn't tell you anything. Um, if you are in a low power setting and get a positive result, maybe you get a hint of something going on there, but there's a very good chance it's a false positive. And so, so for these reasons, we really emphasize adequate power for studies. Yeah. Well, okay, we, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, well, you know, it's a, that's a difficult thing. Um, if you see a trend um, in a low power situation, you basically have a, what, what you know, it, it could be, what, all you can really say to that is maybe another study should be done that has more power. Um, you can't really conclude that the trend you're seeing is real. Um, but you could just simply say, well, this, we did a small sample size study, and the trend is consistent with an effect. Another, we're going to have to do more research to figure this out. I mean, that, that's pretty much what the conclusion is there. You could think of an analog, like, like say you think, you know, since this is election season, you have an opinion. Say you do, um, that you have an expectation that one candidate's ahead by 10 percentage points. Um, but you do an opinion poll that's got 10 people in it. Right, and so you get you get a you do the, the the poll and you find and you end up concluding there's a ten percent point ten percentage point you know the poll suggests a ten percent difference that's consistent with there being that much difference in reality but you really don't know the margin of error is so huge that it's just not very informative by itself um, um, but really all, what you would the proper interpretation of that is as well the data is consistent with this ten percent point difference but we're going to need to do a bigger survey to really find out. And, that, that's what it would, and that's how I would characterize trends in underpowered studies. Um, now just to go through this a little bit again, um, a little formally, you know, how do we think of statistical power? Um, this is a little simplified uh, because I'm assuming um, a dichotomous kind of scenario. Um, whereas in reality, in the real world, we usually have continuum that we're dealing with. But um, um, we can envision in this dichotomous scenario a two by two table where the um, columns of the table represent whether or not the, 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 there's a, the intervention, if we're evaluating an intervention, um, has no effect versus does it have a true effect. Um, and the rows of the table have to do with the report, our results, right? So the columns have to do with underlying truth, what they, what's really true in nature, and the rows have to do with the results of our study, right? So our study can either report the results as negative or report the results as positive. Um, the, and then there's four possibilities. So if in truth there is no effect and we report results as negative, then we're, we got the right answer. That's correct. Um, the other, another possibility is that there really is a true effect in nature, in reality, but we got negative results. This failure to detect a true effect is referred to as a type 2 error. Um, and sometimes the probability of this type 2 error is denoted by the Greek letter beta. Um, so that's sometimes called the beta error. Um, another possibility is in truth, there's no effect in the reality, but we get a positive result. Um, and that's referred to as a type 1 error, um, usually denoted by the symbol alpha. Um, and then um, the other possibility is there really is a true effect, um, and we detected it. We got a positive result. Um, and the probability of that is what we mean by statistical power. Okay, this is a situation where there really is an effect out there and we got a positive study that detected that effect. The probability of doing that is power. Um, now, I've expressed this in terms of randomized trials, R which is what I meant by RCT. Uh, and um, so we're talking about effects of an intervention versus uh, or not. Uh, the same th ideas apply for any kind of relationship that you might be evaluating statistically. Um, so no effect, you could replace that with no relationship and true effect could be replaced by uh, the hypothesis that there really is a relationship in, in what you're studying. Okay, um, so what is statistical power? 
power again is the chance of detecting a treatment effect which is really there. Um, and usually we try to set the power to be pretty high in the, in the 80 to 95 percent range for a plausible effect size. Um, again, we counterbalance power with the chance of a type 1 error, which is the probability of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true. Uh, the type 1 error generally in, in statistic, in, when we're doing research studies should be kept to be less than 5 percent, sometimes smaller depending on the situation, but generally speaking it should be less than 5 percent. Uh, we keep this probability low because it's important that as we accumulate a body of uh, scientific research that we don't clutter the body of reported positive findings with findings that are actually false, right? If we, because we, you know, as we build the research, as we build up knowledge in a certain area, it's important that that knowledge base be kept free of, of false findings. Uh, so that's, that's really one of the reasons why we keep the uh, type 1 error low. Um, now, study sample size power analyses um, are really part and parcel of the overall study design process. Um, and so when we're working out sample size and power, this is very much an interactive process um, as we, it, where we would start off with the research question, specifying the design and major variables. Um, then we come up with hypotheses. You can think of these as reflecting infinite data sets, so we don't have any kind of random noise or whatever, um, but we're making hypotheses about the population we're studying or about the underlying reality that we're studying. Um, what effect size do we expect? Um, and then we go on to formulate statistical methods and do a sample size calculation. Um, very often when we do the sample size calculation, we find out that it's not feasible to do this research, right? We find out that, this, that, that, that the study design is just not going to provide adequate power. Um, and when that happens, we have to go back and either refine the design, refine the research question, refine the outcome variables, change things around a little bit, and we will keep this process going until we actually finally come up with um, a, a, a sample size that's feasible within a study design to answer the, the research question. Um, something that's um, um, should be emphasized is there really have been a number of arguments that doing underpowered studies, it's not just bad research, but it's been, this has been criticized as unethical, uh, if, certainly if you're doing research involving patients. Um, and the argument here is that if um, you sell a patient on doing a research study, the patient is envisioning that they actually are contributing to, to the acquisition of, of knowledge, that they're contributing something to the world. Um, but if you have them doing an underpowered study, in some ways the, the argument is, is that you are uh, misleading the patient, that they're really not contributing to, um, uh, to a study that, that, that could actually definitively answer a question. Um, okay, I want to just take another angle of this to sort of illustrate a little bit more the implications of, of having inadequately powered studies. Um, um, I talked about the type 1 and type 2 error. Flip side of that is um, when you, after you publish the result of your study, what is the probability that that result that you've published is incorrect? This is a little different than um, the type 1 and type 2 error. Um, the, the implications of what you publish um, can be expressed in terms of the positive conclusion error rate and the negative conclusion error rate. Positive conclusion error rate is once you've published the result um, and concluded that it's a positive finding, what is the probability that that positive finding is in fact a true positive? Um, and we're going to, um, that's the probability of a positive conclusion uh, given a true positive, a, a true positive. I mean, given that you've published a positive result. And you can think of that as a positive predictive value associated with the result. The corresponding error rate, a positive conclusion error rate, means that's the probability that if you report a positive conclusion, 
what is the probability that that conclusion is an error, right? So, um, and then correspondingly, the negative conclusion error rate is, it, what's the probability that if you report a negative conclusion, that that negative conclusion is in an error? Okay, and you can think of this, you could attribute these error rates to the published literature. When you find a positive conclusion reported in the literature, what's the probability that that conclusion is an error? That would be the positive conclusion error rate. And if you see a negative conclusion reported in the literature, what's the probability that that's an error? That would be the negative conclusion error rate. Um, these positive and negative conclusion error rates, it turns out that they depend on power, um, as indicated by this formula, um, but they also depend on another quantity, um, a, um, a ratio which is called sometimes just R in the literature. And this is the ratio of the number of true effects to the number of null effects that's tested by a research program. And we can think of this ratio as reflecting the focus of the program, reflecting the extent to which hypotheses that are tested um, have really been vetted well, thought through well. Um, it's probability, it's the ratio of, of hypotheses that are actually true. Um, higher R values reflect well-focused research programs that by the time you get to statistical testing, the hypotheses have a reasonable chance of being true. Low values of R, um, a research program with a low value of R can reflect more scattershot research where you're just sort of testing things willy-nilly. Um, so um, the positive predictive value um, um, is the probability that if a reporter if a finding is positive, what's the probability that it's really f positive? This is one minus the false discovery probability or this is what I called on the preceding slide the positive conclusion error rate. Uh, one minus the positive predictive value is that positive conclusion error rate. So if you, have, you want to have a high positive predictive value so that your positive conclusion error rate is low. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, and just sort of let's think through which result might be more impressive. So let's suppose we have Sam, the, Sam Shotgun, Wanda Well Focused. They both have research programs going on. Uh, but let's suppose that Sam Shotgun's research program, he just rapidly churning out things without really thinking things through very well. Um, and his R value is 10%, which means that 10% of the research hypothesis evaluated in Sam Shotgun's research program are true. Um, but Wanda Well Focused, it's more thoughtful research. Um, the the hypotheses are more refined and well developed. And we'll suppose that 60% of the research hypothesis are true for Wanda Well Focused. Sam Shotgun um, obtains a p-value of 0.02 based on an underfunded study where the actual true power is just 30 percent, okay, the true power being quite low. Wanda Well Focus gets a p-value that's higher, uh, 0.04, based on a well-funded study with good statistical power of 90 percent. So the, even though the p-value is lower for the Sam Shotgun study, it turns out that the research with that, the, the higher p-value in the well-focused study actually does provide more compelling evidence. And I'll try to explain this here. Um, this just represents a couple of scenarios here. Um, the um, um, true hypothesis rate, I use theta here, I apologize for that, that should have been r to be consistent with the last slide. Uh, but with this R of either 10% or 60%. Um, and then we've assumed either the true statistical power is 30% or 90%. Um, and the positive and negative conclusion error rates are given in the final two columns. Um, and so some of the things we can see here, um, the, uh, and, and I'm assuming throughout that the type 1 error is 5%. So um, if we go to the inadequately powered study with a low R, so unfocused research, underpowered work, 60% um, of the time, um, positive results. These are results that have p-values less than 0.05, you know, results that are nominally statistically significant at the 5% level. 60% of 
that work, which is reported as positive, is actually in error. Right? That means 60% false positive, there's a 60% chance that any positive conclusion is actually a false positive conclusion. Way higher than that 5% alpha level. Um, there's also an 8% chance that if you get a negative result, um, that that's a false negative in that case. Um, going to a larger sample size in this kind of shotgun unfocused research approach reduces the positive conclusion error rate some, but it's still reasonably high. Um, now, if you have focused research, um, if it's focused but underpowered, um, you still have pretty high positive conclusion and negative conclusion error rate. Certainly higher, the positive conclusion error rate is still higher than that 5% level that we feel comfortable with. So you really need to have both well-focused research to get that positive conclusion error rate down and an adequately large sample size so to keep, to keep the positive conclusion error rate under 5%. That's really the only way you can do it. Um, You'll, you'll have, it, it, with that kind of scenario, you're still going to have some, some risk of negative conclusions, but this is really just a trade-off that we make in science. In these situations, do you ever um, advise to decrease the type 1 error rate? Yes. Do you ever yeah. The so, so, the so the type 1 error, it does depend on a couple of things. Um, one issue is sometimes you reduce type 1 error rate in scenarios where you're doing multiple analyses. So one way of, if you can't be focused enough to have a single pre-specified primary analysis, one way of dealing with that is, re, is reducing the threshold for type 1 error. Um, and that gives you protection um, in a global sense of making type 1 errors across multiple different analyses. The other reason you might reduce that type 1 error threshold is if um, is in settings where a false positive, where the risk of a false positive conclusion is very high, where you want to avoid that. Um, FDA, before they approve a new labeling for a drug, um, they usually focus on either having two studies with a type 1 error less than 5%, or if you're doing a single study, that means if it's 0.05 times 0.05, so 0 0.00025. So they, they, they put a very low threshold. Sometimes they negotiate this, but, but that's their the principle. And the reason for this is, is they really don't want to approve um, a, um, a drug or product getting on the market if, in fact, it's not effective. Right? Uh, um, so they, they, they will sometimes use very, very low thresholds. Oh, well, um, I, you know, I think ideally you, I mean, at least in my mind, I think this is, when we're thinking of the 5% alpha, I think the same reasoning processes that apply to the 5% threshold apply to the positive conclusion error rate too. So I would argue you really would like the positive conclusion error rate to be less than 5, you know, you, you would like that not to be greater than 5% usually. Uh, these things are context dependent. So there might be circumstances where you could afford a higher one. Um, one place where you might afford a higher one is where the result of your study um, isn't going to be to affect clinical practice or even affect the body of scientific knowledge, but it's just considered a preliminary study that's going to lead to another study later. So in early phases of research, when you're doing pilot study, preliminary study, those might be settings where a higher positive conclusion error rate would be acceptable. Yeah. Concerning the R, um, yeah. That's a very tough one, um, and 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 in th I and I think to be honest, for the most part, this is a conceptual kind of um, paradigm as opposed to one you used on, in day-to-day -day practice, because um, it really is very very difficult to determine a true R, um, but it, you can kind of get the conceptual flavor of well-focused versus scattershot research. Um, now, it's Ian Eadie's guy who I mentioned a minute ago who had published the article about most research findings, most medical research is false. He's done and his, he's got a whole team, an investigative team at Stanford that do, they do all kinds of meta-analyses and systematic reviews. 
And they've made arguments that uh, trying to evaluate this R factor based on uh, you know, published research. Uh, it, it depends a lot on the context of the research. Um, but they have tried to come up with some vague ideas of what R is in different settings. Uh, but by and large, um, this is, I, I should be clear there, I'm bringing in this R more to make a point than to think of something that you actually bring into a research study. Um, okay. Um, this is um, another graph um, that just gives a little more detail of that single example I just gave. Um, the positive predictive value is on the vertical axis. And again, you can think of um, 1 minus the prop positive predictive value is that probability of a false positive. That's the positive conclusion error rate. Um, so you'd like positive predictive value to be as high as possible. And it would need to be 0.95 in order for the positive conclusion error rate to be less than 5%. Um, but you can see here that R is very, very important. Doing well-focused research is very, very important in order to um, uh, keep the positive predictive value high. But power is two. Um, and um, the, the, the challenge is, is that if the sample size calculation, the specifying of effect size is not being done correctly, not being done in an unbiased way, um, you can very often end up with true statistical power in this 10% to 50% or so range. Um, and if you combine that with a low R, you really are in settings where the positive predictive value can be quite low. Okay, I'm going to finish off by talking about another topic um, which can compound challenges with low R or with um, low statistical power. And, and this is the issue of um, selective reporting. Okay, and this is what happens when we don't do analysis plans and we just start doing a bunch of analyses and then do a bunch of analyses and then we report selectively a certain set of those analyses in, in publications. Um, now I'm going to illustrate this. This is, um, I'm using a kind of a cute example, but I think this kind of illustrates the idea. Uh, this is actually something that was done by a tabloid, um, London Times, back in 2004. And um, um, someone there, or someone, um, had collected the zodiac birth signs of 1,067 rich people. Uh, and they, they noted um, that among these rich people, um, Gemini birth sign occurred 100 and you know, more often, 110 times uh, compared to Pisces, right? So the, among the rich, it seemed like more of them were, were Gemini than Pisces. Um, and, you know, if you go look up what Gemini and Pisces mean um, in, like, your astrological tables or whatever, um, you, f um, you get descriptions of Gemini along the lines of driving force of Gemini's is a conversation, of, the, of a Gemini's conversation is their mind, so they're very intellectually inclined, probing people uh, in search of information. Pisces are more wishy-washy, selfless, spiritual, uh, focused on their inner journey, dreams and secrets, co comfortable in an illusory world. <laughs> uh, so you could, uh, without too much difficulty, if you go back, if you going back and looking at this result, kind of make a story, right? You can make a post hoc story to explain why Gemini's would be more likely to accumulate wealth than Pisces, who are, after all, just living in an illusory world. <laughs> um, the uh, and, and so um, and the, the article would look at the, look at that, and they conclude, well, this is basically proof that astrology is valid, right? Because we val we verified that. Uh, in accordance with the descriptions of these signs that, uh, you know, Gemini's were better at accumulating wealth. Uh, can anybody, uh, and in fact, if you do a statistical test, just straight comparison of the frequency of uh, Gemini's to the frequency of Pisces in these wealthy people, um, you get a p-value that's low. It's 0 0.006. What's the problem with this?
or a few problems actually. So <laughs> but the, yes, the main problem that is the post hoc nature of this, right? You got 12 different zodiac signs. So if you look at all comparisons among those 12 signs, um, that's 12 times 11 over 2, that's 66 comparisons. Um, and so that's a lot of different chances to get a significant result. It's very unfocused, it's not pre-specified. It would have been different if they, before looking at these signs, had said, we're going to test the hypothesis that, um, that rich people are more likely to be Gemini than Pisces, right? It's very different than if you try to tell the story afterwards. You can, I mean, at least in my experience working with clinicians, um, even my, myself, I'll say, I shouldn't blame clinicians for this. This my experience in life is just about any, see, any piece of data you can come up with, you can find a story to justify that. Um, and if you, you find this story post hoc, it's very, very then easy to deceive yourself to think that that was pre-specified. That's sort of the, the process that goes on. Um, now another issue, you could bring in the issue of R, you know, the, the fact that we, you know, how likely is the research hypothesis to be true? Um, and I think most of us would probably regard R as not being very high here. Maybe not zero, because we'd be open-minded, but it's probably not very high uh, that zodiac signs really would determine uh, wealth. Um, so, oh, oops, sorry. Let me go back here. So anyway, if you, just dealing with the post hoc issue, um, we can do statistical adjustments to account for the fact that there really are 66 pairs of zodiac signs. Um, and, and one approach is using a Bonferroni adjustment. And had we done that, um, the uh, p-value would have been 0.41. Another thing we could have done is not just <coughs> post hoc, in post hoc fashion, isolated these two signs, but just compare all 12 the frequencies across all 12 signs, and if we did that, the p-value would have been 0.26, right? So if you do a proper p-value here, accounting for the unfocused nature of the hypothesis, then the p-values are well above 0.05. Um, this slide kind of illustrates the combination of all the, what happens with all these bad practices put together. So if you're doing scattershot research with low r-value, post hoc selection across multiple analyses um, and um, low power, um, you end up in this situation over here um, where your positive predictive value, if you get a positive finding doing that kind of research, may be like 25% or so. Whereas well-focused research, um, good statistical power, um, and not doing post hoc types of analyses, your positive predictive value is up there around 95%. Um, I didn't fully describe this. Um, the different curves in these plots are representing um, the number of separate analyses that were done, the number of separate independent analyses that were done, um, where we're assuming that the researcher is publishing the most promising of the different analyses, the, the, the most positive. The, one, the analysis with the lowest p-value across all those analyses. So if n equal 1, that means you had, a, you had an analysis plan that pre-specified a single primary analysis. n equal 8 means they did eight different analyses and they just reported the one that was the most consistent with the research hypothesis. So again, big difference between in the positive predictive value between high power, good focus, and no data dredging versus low power, poor focus, and high data dredging. Okay, so this is why we really harp on these kinds of issues and really harp on pre-specifying um, analyses. Um, and, you know, I've got a few more slides. Um, I'm going to actually skip over these. Um, if you're writing grants, uh, and I'm, probably that's a later stage in research for most of you guys, uh, but we work a lot on grant writing. Um, same, actually these same ideas apply to um, research in general, but I just wanted to give a kind of some of the examples of some of the things we might do if early on it looks like the sample size that's feasible that you can actually attain isn't high enough. 
there's actually many, 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 many different kinds of strategies that we can look at just from a statistical perspective to try to help you come up with a well-powered study. Um, and my last couple of slides here give some examples of that. Um, and I think you guys will have um, access to these. I know I, I think I sent them to the group. So you can look through some of these. Um, okay. Um, any questions? Okay, well, let me just say, um, again, as you get ready for your research projects, uh, if you are going to work with our group, just come soon. <laughs> That's the main, the main message. So thank you very much. I enjoyed talking with you all today. Thank you.